All right, uh, we are officially live. Uh, hello and welcome to a Sigma Facebook Live Q&A, uh, coming to you from the lovely confines of the Sigma Corporation conference room and uh, all across the country. Uh, I'm Nick and I'd like to welcome a trio of experts who are gonna give their impressions of our newest lens, the Sigma 100 to 400 millimeter DGDN OS contemporary uh, for E-mount and L-mount cameras. So uh, first, I'd like to introduce Sigma tech rep, Brett Wells. How you doing, Brett? Hey, Nick, good. And Welcome, uh, everybody. Yep. Thanks, glad to be here. He'll, take, um, he'll help us with all the technical questions that we have today. Uh, we're going to allow you guys to come in, jump on the stream, ask us questions, and we'll do our best to answer them as we go along. Uh, then we have Sigma ambassador, Liam Duran. Hello, Liam. Hi, guys. How's it going? Good to see you all. Liam is an outdoor photographer who's uh, used the new lens for wildlife, landscapes, and uh, action sports so far. So it's been pretty versatile for him. And uh, then I'd like to welcome Kedron Franklin, who is renowned for his very vibrant portrait photography. So hi, Kedron. What's going on? How y'all going... doing today? Uh... <laughs> he brings the energy and he also brings a beautiful background that the rest of us couldn't match. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he's got a couple shots to share with us that uh, utilize uh, strobes at a very um, long portrait uh, focal length. So a few interesting use case scenarios. And um, let's get started uh, with Brett. Uh, I just want to touch on the lens itself. I've got a copy of it right here. Yep. I've got one on a Sony here. Yep. So we've already got one of these uh, 100 to 400 for Canon EF and Nikon F mounts. Uh, but this one is a little bit different. Yes. It is. It's a completely new design, uh, not a port like some of the original art lenses that were taken from the SLR design uh, and just had a, a coupler essentially uh, like building in an MC-11 on the back of the lens. And this is not that way at all. It's a completely new design, uh, designed from the ground up to work with uh, mirrorless systems. It has a different focusing system, again, that uh, fully integrates with all of the features of the Sony E-mount cameras and the Panasonic Leica Sigma uh, L-mount cameras. It's similar in size and weight, um, but again, um, completely new design. It also has uh, the option of adding a tripod collar, which was one of the things requests that we got from uh, the old lens uh, from a few people. It's a really lightweight lens and real easy to handhold, but for those people in those situations that need it, um, that's an option as well. Very good. So we are um, we're shipping this lens now, and it's uh, going across all, the entire country. So check your authorized dealer. Um, we're not. I don't believe we have them on SigmaPhoto.com because we're trying to get them out to all the local dealers. So if you're interested in the 100 to 400, check with your local dealer or check with some of the big dealers that ship all across the country. Um, so it is available now if you're interested in the lens. So why don't we just start talking about some of the different use case scenarios. Uh, Liam, I guess we'll start with you. We gave you this lens uh, a couple weeks ago and you've been able to come up with a lot of different uses for it. You started out with some mountain goats and got some landscapes and all kinds of stuff in between. Yeah, exactly. Um, <clears throat> I had the DSLR version to begin with. That was a favorite lens of mine for years. So when I switched over to Sony, uh, getting the 100-400 DG DN out into the field was awesome. It was, you know, it's a little lighter, a little smaller than a, a traditional wildlife lens. Yeah, so definitely. I took it up on uh, Quandry, which is a 14,000 foot peak up in our backyard. And that was the first thing we did was uh, get photos of the mountain goats. And that was, that was awesome. Um, and I've had a number of questions. People on YouTube were asking me if, what the difference between the DSLR and the DGDN version was. Right. And honestly, I, I optically, you know, it was a little, I thought it was a little faster autofocus wise, but uh, I think it's just as sharp, if not sharper than the DSLR version. So I just want to get that out of the way quick. Um, Cause I had a lot of questions about that. Like, well, which one's better? I was like, well, if you own an E or L mount, then the DGDN is going to be better. And if you own a DSLR, well, Obviously, the DSLR is going to be better for Yeah, you. and there's definitely advantages to having the lens designed natively for your camera. Brett, maybe you can ex expand on that a little bit, because what Liam yeah. was using before was a Canon mount 100 to 400, and right. that was uh, with an MC-11 put on a Sony camera. Right, and the, the way I look at our MC-11 or anybody's mount converter is it acts like a translator. 
And even the best translator is going to take a little bit of time to make those uh, conversions or those translations between a lens that instinctively thinks in Canon uh, terminology and then convert that over to Sony terminology. Um, that's like I said, that's the way I look at it. Um, and it's our MC 11 was a great adapter. It's a really great option for somebody who already has Canon mount lenses. Uh, and it switched over to a Sony mount, uh, or, or an L mount camera, but having a native lens, you take that step out of the process. Uh, and the, every communication from the lens is native. Uh, it, it speaks the same language, if you will, uh, of the camera. So there's no interpolation or interpretation in between. Uh, there's no delay in that, so your autofocus is going to be faster. And the other, the real big advantage is it takes advantage of all of the uh, features of the camera system that way. So a Canon mount lens on an MC11 uh, on a Sony, it may not have worked in every different focus mode uh, or with eye detection or any of those types of, of, of features with the camera, but the native mount lens is going to work uh, in inherently with all of those. Right. Very nice. Um, Kadrian, what were some of your initial impressions of the lens? Uh, Liam, you know, thought it was a, a nice, light, very versatile lens for well, lots of different scenarios. What were your first impressions when you first put it on your camera, got it in your hands? So when I got the lens, I really didn't know what to expect because, you know, I'm used to primes. And right. when I put it on, the 100 to 400, well, I'm always used to shooting longer focal lengths. So when I put it on, I automatically went to 400 millimeters <laughs> at uh, yeah. F6. So shooting that, I'll say the autofocus, it focused really, really good. Um, it was snappy. I didn't have to, and I was shooting in the evening time. So I was shooting around like 6 or 7 p.m. And it was just locking on and it was super sharp. So when I put it in the post, I was like, wow, man, this is a really good lens for portraits, especially if somebody has this lens for like wildlife and then they want to kind of jump into portraits, you can definitely use it for that. Did you find that the, uh, one of the most important things when you're a Sony shooter nowadays is their IAF uh, technology, which I'm a big fan of. Um, how did you find that the lens worked with that specific technology? Well, I don't use that feature. I'm still Oh, look at you. <laughs> yeah, I'm still old school. So even though I have the Sony A7R uh, Mark III, I still focus and recompose. And I use a small uh, focusing point every single time. I mean, I'll use it every now and again, but I didn't use it with this lens. I just, I'm just so accustomed to using it, just focus and recompose. All right. Well, um, I'll vouch for it. I used it this morning uh, for some shots at a <laughs> communion, and it, it was great. Um, all right, so why don't we uh, share a few of our shots. Uh, Liam, I guess we'll start again with you. You have all those uh, beautiful shots of the mountain goats and everything yes, else. So maybe we can just scroll through uh, your Lightroom gallery and uh, I'll keep an eye on the feed in case we have any questions. By the way, everyone out there, if you're watching, please feel free to ask questions. So let's see, is that coming up? It sure is. Uh, so, well, I was gonna start, actually, let's do this. Let's start from the beginning. The first shoot I had it out. Um, and we took it out into, like I said, I was up on Quandry. This is a 14,000 foot peak. I wasn't quite up at 14,000 feet. I was, uh, probably at 12 or 13,000 feet, mm -hmm. but having a lighter, smaller, more powerful package is really advantageous at elevations like that. And here I'm just shooting through some willow bushes and I was just kind of noting how well the camera and lens work together to keep focus on the eye of the mountain goat here, just shooting right through the leaves. And what else? And we had this big guy coming right at me. That was pretty exciting. That got a little too close. <laughs> um, and then I used it in, you know, in ways like where I was shooting a little wider showing the goats in their element and then also shooting significantly tighter as more of like a wildlife portrait almost. Um, and I, I just love this shot. The light is great. Everything looks really nice, ultra sharp. And I'm just going to zoom in here so people can see, and it might take my computer a second to like catch up and snap into its full sharpness. But here we are at two to one and it's just, Gorgeous. As soon yeah. as I zoomed into this, you could see every little detail and hair in there, and it just looks fantastic. The eyes are tack sharp. It's um, so cool how that rim light just kind of 
really focuses on the hairs, you know, it, it kind of oh, bangs absolutely. them out. So if, if you were shooting of a portrait of a person, you'd have to Photoshop those out. But with the goat, it looks really cool. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, for this stuff, this is what I was looking for. I love these backlit kind of side lit backlit shots where you have the mountain in the background. So you, so you can see the animal in his natural element, but he's kind of lit up nicely and you get the rim lighting on his fur there. Um, so that was, that was my first night out with it. And it was, it was awesome. It was a very successful night out. And then we got out, we had a June snowstorm up here. So I just got it out real quick. I didn't really have anything set up. I just ran out the door because the uh, storm broke and I just wanted to go capture a few quick shots of the mountains in June uh, with a fresh coat of snow on them. So that was kind of cool. And I think this is, and this is kind of my playground here. This is my backyard. I spend a lot of time in these zones, skiing and mountain biking and fly fishing and backpacking and wildlife and landscape. It's all kind of right here, right in my backyard. Um, and then the second shoot we took it out for was a little bit of mountain biking. And I went out with a few friends. Again, this is just down the road. And I was really, what I was testing here was how fast the autofocus would be when the athletes are moving really fast, just like flying at me or flying away from me whatever it may be. And it did really, really well. Um, and here I'm using a real backlit situation, which is, which is very hard for a camera lens sometimes to keep yeah. focus when it's backlit like that. Um, but it really tracks focus incredibly well. And then the last thing I did on this shoot was just check out the optical stabilization. So I did it, put it in type two pan and did some pan shots just to kind of get some, get a feel for how well it would work. And it did awesome as you can see here you know our rider is nice and sharp but the foreground and background are totally blurred out making it look like he's going you know a thousand miles an hour and then the third shoot we took it out on was a backpacking shoot i did three days up in the sangre de cristo wilderness and i was looking for bighorn sheep uh, and we found them i found them in a couple different places it was really really an amazing shoot but here i have a backpack filled with gear for three days of living out in the wilderness. So my tent, my sleeping bag, my food, my cook gear and everything else. And the idea of bringing something big, like a, like a, a 500 F4 or a 400 2A, it's just, it's too much. You can't haul that out there for multiple days of shooting. So the 100, 400 fit really nicely in my pack and enabled me to get these nice tight super, uh, sorry, super sharp shots. A little bit of a tongue twister there. Uh, while I was out in the back country and I found these, so I got these guys in the forest and they were also up in the rocks here. Um, and then on that trip too, I also did use it for some landscape, you know, there's some waterfalls out there. So I set it up and just got a couple of quick landscape shots with the lens as well. So that was kind of how I started since then I've been remodeling my bathroom. So I haven't shot a whole lot in the last week and a half, 10 days, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, that was, those are the first three shoots we got it out in. So we got some landscapes, some, some, some uh, mountain bike action, some wildlife, and really it's just been an absolute pleasure to shoot with. Very nice. Um, yeah, definitely uh, speaks to the versatility of the lens. So, I mean, you had so many different uses for it. Um, right. Obviously lightweight enough that you could bring it out um, and backpack with it and uh, put it through its paces. Now, one thing I, I wanna um, sort of toss out to everybody is uh, the optical stabilization. So um, to this point, the DGDN lenses that we've introduced haven't had optical stabilization built into the lens. It was uh, basically decided that the camera bodies were, had enough stabilization with sensor shift to handle any stabilization that was necessary. It didn't need to go into the lens that would just add cost and it would add weight. This one does have it. Um, because it's a long focal length or a long focal range, I should say. And um, I just wanted to get your impressions on how it helped uh, with your photography, or did you notice that maybe you didn't need it, or how did the different OS modes work? So, um, Kijan, because uh, Liam had some time there, I'd like to start with you, if you used the stabilization and how it worked on, on your camera during your shoots. Okay, so when I shot with Pink Minx, since I was shooting at 400, I really needed that uh, stabilization on because I wasn't at my one 400 shutter speed. I was only at one 250. So I could tell like when my lens was all the way out to 400, I'm a shaky baby. So when I'm doing, I'm shaking all the time. So I need that extra stabilization. So I had to turn it on. 
let's clarify real quick. Pink Minx is, you can see her in your monitor behind you. Uh, we'll share that image in a minute. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, Liam, you mentioned that you used one of the other OS modes. Um, there's OS 1, which is essentially for handheld, yep. and OS 2, which is a little bit different. Maybe you could um, expand on that a little bit. Yeah, OS 2 is really designed for, for panning shots. So if you're shooting race cars or birds or mountain bikers or anything that's moving fast and you're going to be holding it and panning with the subject, it does a really good job of keeping your subject sharp while letting the background go to blur. And that's something I use quite often, actually. I use type two OS. I actually use both type one and type two optical stabilization very often. Um, and in fact, I would say in general, I keep the type one OS on almost at all times. Mm -hmm. And when I showed you some of the mountain goats in the forest, I got really lucky with that. I had been shooting some other landscape stuff and I was at a one one sixty. Uh, no, sorry, one sixtieth of a second shutter speed and those goats came running out of nowhere and I just picked up the camera and started shooting and didn't really pay attention to what I was doing. So those first few shots that you saw of the goats in the forest were shot at handheld at 1 60th of a second at, well, that, I don't think they were quite at 400, but somewhere in there, 330, 350, something like that. And so I was just holding it and then I realized what I was doing 10 or 12 shots in. I was like, oh my gosh, it's way too slow. But the OS in the lens was good enough to make those shots sharp enough as the goats were standing there, or the sheep, I should say, the bighorn sheep. Brett, there's a few other uh, buttons here in this lens, and considering that this is a very affordable lens, we should we should mention that as well. It's only nine forty nine. Um, maybe just get some feedback on this. It's it's really nice that we have all of this, uh, all these capabilities here. And I don't know if it shows up really clear on camera, and it's probably backwards. But we've got a focus switch. Uh, with autofocus and manual focus, that's pretty standard. But then we've got a focus limiter switch and an AFL button. Um, just in case the people who are watching aren't really familiar with those controls, what exactly do those uh, do and how do they benefit the photographer? So a focus limiter uh, is exactly what it sounds like. It just limits the range of focus that the lens is allowed to use. Uh, and so basically you have a close range and a long range. Uh, it's a very common thing on macro lenses because you've got the extreme close range and a normal range. Uh, that you might be using the lens. And on a long lens like this, you've got the range where mountain goats and sheep and, and uh, birds in flight and those kind of things at a long range, there's no reason to allow the lens to focus really, really close to the camera. So if you turn, the feet, turn that switch to the long setting, uh, it just enables the focus acquisition to be a little bit faster. Uh, the, the lens, if the, the camera's looking for uh, the focus point to lock on, it doesn't have to go through uh, as great a range in order to find it. So it just speeds up that focus acquisition. Same thing on the short end, if I'm shooting portraits, uh, shooting anything closer uh, with the lens, I don't need to let it go into the long range. And then the button underneath that is auto uh, focus lock. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it does exactly what it sounds like too. You just push the button and it's going to lock the autofocus on exactly where you want it, but it keeps the camera controls all set. It gives the focus feedback to the camera. Uh, camera's still going to fire, exposures locked uh, or set by the camera, those kind of things as well. So uh, you're following a bird in flight, it lands on a branch. I can just lock the focus on that point and then I don't even have to have the camera try to refocus and I can recompose the image uh, without changing the focus point on the back of the camera or anything like that. I want to mention here, we, we got a few comments and a couple of questions. Just someone was real nice here uh, mentioning that we got the big guns here. We got Duran, Wells, and Franklin. Damn, that's like the BGs of photography. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another, another one uh, says, um, Franklin, you're looking real good, bro. Proud and excited for you. And also that uh, you've got the freshest looking background, and I have to agree with that. Oh, yeah. No, no competition. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I think he's got he, – uh, the gauntlet has been thrown. I think the competition has begun now. We're going to have to change some things around here. I know. We're going to have to up our game. Yeah, Absolutely. With lights on it, at least. Uh, I got a question from John. He's asking about uh, using a 1.4x teleconverter. Will I lose any image quality? Before you answer that question, Brett, I should mention that the 1.4x teleconverter is only available in L mount at the moment. From us, yes. Uh, we have a 1.4 and a 2x converter for L mount. So if you're putting this lens 
uh, on the Sigma FP uh, or the Panasonic S1s uh, or the Leica SLs, uh, then you've got those options uh, in the teleconverters. And for those of you who aren't familiar, a 1.4 converter, uh, you're going to magnify the image by 40%. Uh, so this is gonna take a 400 millimeter lens up to a 560 millimeter lens. Uh, you lose one stop of light, so your focus, uh, your aperture goes off by one stop. 2X converter just doubles everything. So an F5.6 is gonna go to F11. Uh, <clears throat> the 100 to 400 goes to a 200 800. Uh, on our camera, focus is perfectly well. Um, most mirrorless cameras have a lot better focus capabilities with higher ISOs than DSLRs did because you're using the whole sensor to autofocus rather than uh, a separate autofocus sensor that's in the light path, uh, in the prism, whatever, uh, in front of the front of the camera. So um, one thing I will admit though, I have not tested this lens on a Sony with Sony's teleconverters. They make a 1.4 and a 2X converter. Uh, mm -hmm. It's quite possible that they work very well, but I honestly don't know. I haven't had the lens long enough uh, and I've been stuck in my house and haven't had access to uh, any of the Sony teleconverters to try it out. Uh, so I know it works with ours. Uh, hopefully it will work with theirs. All right, a couple other quick questions. Um, does the optical stabilization work with L-mount cameras, uh, the L-mount Alliance camera? Um, and basically what you just talked about, like the Panasonic Lumix S1, S1R, those types of cameras, the optical stabilization is totally compatible with those, of course, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, another question, can you please stop making so many awesome primes? It's getting harder to hide my Sigma purchases. Yeah, um, we're going to keep doing that. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So, um, Kadrian, why don't we get to a couple of your photos? Uh, I just want to, I'm going to pull them up since you're facing away from your computer and I'll, and I'll share my screen real quick. All right. All right. And every, everybody see this? <laughs> my gosh. We love Kijan style. Um, now this is the uh, aforementioned pink minx, I believe the name was. Yep. Pink minx. All right, so you shot this picture, I believe, at 400 millimeters. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the shoot and uh, how you achieved the look you were going for. Okay, so I got to give a shout out to uh, my uh, partner, Samantha. She helps me out. She picked the location. Her and Pink Minks picked the location. And when I got there, I was like, okay, it's a graffiti wall. I know how I like all my colors to pop out. And just using the lens earlier that day, I already knew I wanted to shoot at 400 and I knew it was gonna be like F6.3. Uh, so I had the OS on uh, uh, the, the number one. Uh, while going there, I had to set my light up. So with this shot, we used a cheetah stand 32 by 48 window light. It was double diffused. It was handheld by my wife uh, using the Godox 8600 Pro. And we had that maybe like two, two, two or three feet away from the model feather. Uh, and then I had to back up to Balcom Jungle to <laughs> get the shot and get the depth of field that I needed. So I, what I did was I had the model to move away from the wall quite a bit just so I could get that separation from the wall from her. And then I moved myself like all the way back. I mean, I was pretty far. Yeah. She could still hear me because I'm loud. I was going to uh, ask, but how far away from the wall was she here? Because the, you know, the background just melts away. I, I assume that wall was, you know, pretty uh, gritty looking and, you know, real sharp colors. Yeah, so she was maybe, maybe 12, 13 feet away from the wall. But when you shoot a, tele, uh, uh, a telephoto lens, it compresses everything. So it makes it right. look like she's like right up on the wall. Right. Um, but she can still hear me because, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty loud person. So I didn't really need a microphone. And I know in my comments on my Instagram, a lot of people were like, hey, how far you are? I wasn't kind of doing steps. I just know I was pretty far. Uh, after What's... that, we, uh, we got our exposure. Shooting at F6.3, uh, at that time of day, I had to raise up my ISO to like ISO 200. And I think my shutter speed was like one 200 of a second. And like I said, the end of the stabilization, Opti uh, on there, I had to have it on because I was shaking. I had it off at first and I was missing. So I had to turn it on and actually this shot came out and I just knew it when I hit it. I was like, this is the one. Let's, uh, let's get in some right in there on our face. So if you guys are concerned about sharpness, 
on a lens. I mean, look at her hair. Everything is just so beautifully sharp. And with that telephoto uh, focal range, like you said, you can get that background separation, you get that compression so that you can pull your subject away from the background. And uh, this is really beautiful work, Adrian. Thank you. You know, a lot of people uh, ask, well, can I shoot with a, a zoom like a 70 to 200 Sigma at 200 millimeter? Absolutely. You shoot it at 2.8, you move your subject away from the wall, you uh, put some good space in between you and the subject and you will create that uh, depth of field that you want. You know, and I think it also uh, speaks to the versatility of the lens. Um, a lot of people, if they're thinking about shooting portraits, they're only going to consider an 85 135 something prime with a really big aperture but this shows that you can get really high quality very sharp portraits with nice background compression and uh, separation and you can do it with a telephoto zoom with you know a variable aperture range it, it can be done and you know you don't have to have all of that lighting equipment but it sure it sure helps it really made your subject pop here thank you Really nice work. And we got another example of that. I think you guys so, can see this. So for that one, uh, it was, I think it was pretty much the same settings. I was laying on the ground. You know, a lot of Sony users say, hey, hey, you got the flip out screen. Why are you laying on the ground? I just like <laughs> laying, messing up my clothes. <laughs> you know what? Your clients appreciate it too. They're like, Kidron was on the ground. Can you believe that? That's funny. I only thought outdoor photographers were laying on the ground. I do that all the time. I'm always in the dirt and in the mud and snow, but that's good to know. All right. Yeah. Heck well, yeah. Liam, the difference is that you do it for, for yourself. You just like laying down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for this particular image, I was laying on the ground, but Pink Minx, anytime I shoot her, she always brings like these She's a great model. I don't even have to direct her. She just knows what to do. And although I had uh, a couple of other shots, this is the one that I like the most. Mm -hmm. It just kind of just like reminds me that she was just, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it. It's just, my mind works totally different when I'm, when I'm shooting. And I know a lot of people always, you know, ask me, what do I look for uh, when I go out on a shoot? Well, first, I look at the model's clothes to see if I can get some good contrast and, you know, the color pop, you know, cause you, 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 you need to make sure that your colors are like, for me, cohesive. So if you look here, my background is not over empowering my model because I added my light in and it just made my subject just pop. And even though all of that color and all that stuff in the background, your, your eyes still go to my subject. That's right. And you don't have to dial down the, the green on the grass or the magenta in the background. None of that. It, she still just pops out from the background. And that has a lot to do with the lighting. It also has some, something to do with the lens. So it's really great that you're able to get a shot like this using uh, that, that Nick, here. So I want to say one more thing. So with people out there that have the 100 to 400 lens, Mm -hmm. And if you are trying to get the depth of field like you would get a, with the 135, that if people who follow me on Instagram know I shoot with the 135 Sigma all the time, it's like my absolutely favorite lens. Yep. I, it hardly ever comes off my camera until this one. <laughs> so <laughs> if you take this image, I didn't do it for this image because we were going to have a live and I started to, but if you want that extra depth of field, you can add it in post and make it look so authentic that I could have got that 135 look out of this uh, 6.3 uh, aperture. Very nice. Thank you very much, Kedron, for uh, sharing that. I'm going to browse real quick to see if we have any uh, cool. Oh, there's the 70 to 200 question I was talking about. <laughs> we don't know when it's coming, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> they, they wouldn't tell us uh, uh, even, if we, even if we asked. We need a 200 millimeter F2. We've got a long list of requests, and I'm sure Japan is aware of all of them. Um, Brett, you do a lot of uh, birding photography. Uh, what optical stabilization mode would you use for birds in flight? Uh, two, all the time. Uh, like Liam was saying, yeah, and uh, it's not just, uh, some people call it painting mode, and that's a great way to think about it, and I think that's a lot of the way Liam's using that, is trying to follow, I mean, following a bird is basically the same thing. Um, 
the way the, the technology works is normally in a stabilizer, the lens is sensing motion in any direction. You're shaking this way, a little bit side to side, whatever. And the element in the back, the optical element in the stabilizer is trying to compensate for that amount of motion. Uh, in, in mode two, it's smart and it knows that if I'm continuously moving in the same direction, well, that's probably intentional. So let's allow that, that direction and we'll cancel out all of the other motion of the lens. So uh, the older technology 10 years ago, uh, mode two was, was exactly panning and that's really all it did. Uh, most of the lenses now, or, or all the lenses now from Sigma mode two uh, works in any axis. So even if the bird is flying up or the bird is flying down toward me, whichever way I'm following it, the lens is sensing that direction of motion and allowing it and then compensating every other shake in the lens. All right. Um, what vendors actually have this in stock and are shipping immediately? Uh, quite a few of them. If you go to uh, sigmaphoto.com and you go to the product page, just click on find a dealer and it should bring up a uh, list of dealers that have the lens in stock right now. Um, or you can just search your favorite dealers uh, page. I know that some of them, some of the larger dealers are having a little bit of trouble keeping it in stock, but they will be getting more. So uh, don't worry, the lens is coming if they don't have it. Yeah, we have shipped quite a few. Uh, it's been a very, very popular lens uh, very, very quickly. But like uh, Nick said, it's hard to for us to keep tabs on what the dealers have in stock because what we ship them goes right back out their doors. So, What camera does Keydron use? I believe you said it was a A7R III? Yes, uh, I used the A7R III and then for my video I used the A7 III. And if I can get past my wife and slip it in, the A7S III. <laughs> was that announced yet? I, don't, I can't <laughs> Yeah, it was. Okay. Well, not fully, but they have had rumors out already. Okay, so there's been leaks. Um, Liam, and I think you're shooting with an A9, right? I have an A9 II that I use quite a bit. I use that for any time they're going to be in, you know, uh, sand, snow, rain, anything like that. And I use it for my action sports. And then I also have the A7 III that I use quite a bit um, for less extreme environments or for portraits, uh, stuff like that. And landscape too. I use that for a lot of my landscapes as well. But when I head down to the Grand Canyon a week from today, actually, I'll have the A9 II with me. I'll bring that one. And the FP. I was going to mention the FP. Um, Brett, the 100 to 400, while you wouldn't think of it traditionally as a video lens, uh, it certainly can be versatile for video as well. And since most people look at the FP as sort of a, uh, a video tool, um, how will this lens benefit people who are shooting video with the FP or with the Lumix S1 um, or, you know, other platforms like that? Well, sure. Um, it, it is, the, 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 the focus system is very fast, uh, very quiet, and it integrates with the, uh, the video focus features on the S, uh, S1 Panasonics or on, on our RFP. So whatever subject matter is appropriate for a 100 to 400 millimeter lens, uh, you know, if you're shooting, doing video of wildlife, um, that kind of footage, uh, it's a, a very, very practical lens uh, for that type of thing. And again, extremely sharp and, and compact with a lot of range uh, in one little lens. So. All right. So um, we've gone a little bit more than half an hour. So I think this is probably a good time to start wrapping up. Uh, guys, do you have any other sort of final thoughts about the lens? Any impressions that we haven't, anything that we haven't gone over yet that you really want to get out to the audience? Uh, Kedron, why don't we start with you? Um, final thoughts, just if you're in the market to get a versatile lens, especially between the range 100 to 400, I mean, it is definitely worth getting, especially being at the price range around $900. You really can't beat that. And as you can see, you can really get good portraits out of it. So if you're doing landscapes, well, I ain't going to even say landscapes, but birding, uh, wildlife, uh, portraits, even video, like I didn't have a chance to shoot it because I sent it back to Nick with video, but I mean, Sorry. of course. <laughs> no, 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 it was fine. But yeah, I would have- Everyone I wants to get their hands on it, so yeah. But I mean, also, you know, y'all, Sigma has been so grateful, I mean, so good to me that I have the the center lenses here, the 18 to 35 and the 50 to 100. So I have those two. Very nice. 
Uh, Liam, what did you think overall? I mean, you've still uh, got your hands on yours. You're, you're taking yeah. it out to the Grand Canyon this week. Yep, yep, we'll exactly. What, what comes and, out of that? Yeah, it's going to be awesome. We're really excited. And uh, But I think the bottom line is that for, what, what is it, 949 Yes. For an unbelievable price, you get an ultra sharp, fast, light, powerful lens that is really good for anywhere from a full blown professional user to someone going to Rocky Mountain National Park for the first time and wants a nice lens to capture some of the elk and the moose and the landscapes out there. For under a thousand bucks, you have the perfect lens for for that person it's a it's a phenomenal national park lens um but it's also great for professionals to use as well I and mean, if you just combine that with a 24 to 70 uh something along those lines 24 to 105 i mean you basically got every uh every focal length covered under yeah. the sun um so just those two lenses makes a phenomenal travel kit absolutely uh, Brett, I'll just throw a couple quick questions at you before we sign off. Uh, where can I get the tripod collar? It doesn't come with the lens, uh, but if you have the 105 millimeter art lens, you can right. use that one, although the, the, the tripod collar that we make for the 100 to 400 is a little bit different. It comes with a few extra parts, so maybe you can just clarify. Uh, honestly, I haven't seen the one that we make for the lens. All I have oh. is this one that came with the 105, uh, <laughs> and it does fit perfectly. The, the lens itself, uh, if you've seen any of the ones that have removable collars that we've made uh, in the last couple of years, there's a rubber ring on the back here that just slides off the set of pins, and then you have to take it off the camera, but there you go. So that yeah. rubber ring comes off, but that makes it look more attractive, but also more comfortable in your hands if you're not using the tripod collar. Um, but you take that off the, the camera, pull the rubber ring off, and the uh, tripod collar just twists on and then locks in place. Uh, you can order those kind of things through any dealer. Uh, whether or not they have them in stock is another story. Uh, you can also find them on our website. But uh, again, I don't know what the stock is like on that accessory at this point. Okay. And at, uh, another question. At higher shutter speeds, would you recommend turning off the OS? I mean not really necessary, right? It's not, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, it, it depends on which way I'm starting. If I'm starting really early in the morning with a lot of, with very, very little light, uh, I'm probably starting with the OS on. And then a lot of times I just forget to turn it off. If I'm starting with a lot of daylight, if I'm shooting birds in flight, I'm gonna try to keep my shutter speed up at 1500 or 2000 anyway. And at that point, no, the, the stabilizer is not doing a bit of good. Um, I don't need it. The, the shutter speed alone is going to freeze all, all of the motion, whether that's from my hands or from the subject. Uh, but I don't, I haven't found that it makes a difference at that range either to keep it on. So it's, it's just kind of there as a, a safety net for me if in case I turn my shutter speeds down. And one other thing that we've mentioned uh, numerous times over the course of this live stream is how lightweight the lens is. Do you have an exact weight, Brett? Uh, I believe it's right around two and a half pounds. I, I'd have to go back to the, the manufacturer's specs. Again, I mean, but. I, I've seen a number of YouTube videos with people just kind of juggling it around in their hands. Um, it's really that light. I mean, it sure it is. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just saying it sure is light because when I took it out of the box, it's like, man, this thing don't have no weight at all because I'm used to like <laughs> seven pound lenses. <laughs> Yeah. So to put it in perspective, it's lighter than most 70 to 200 2 8s. So if you're comfortable handholding a 70 to 200, you can handhold this without any problem at all. Uh, especially on a mirrorless camera, you've got nice compact systems. Uh, I'm I'm dying to get this on the FP uh, in what's going to be the smallest package in a, a zoom of that range on the market. It'll be, it'll be great. All right, guys. Well, I uh, guess this is about time to wrap it up. So I'd like to thank all of you personally right now for joining us on this live stream. Liam and Kadrian, especially thank you for taking the time out of your day to uh, not only shoot with these lenses, but to share the images with us. So thank you guys very much. Very welcome. Very welcome. And uh, Brett, thank you for offering your technical expertise here on the live awesome. stream. And uh, everybody out there for more information about this or any other Sigma products, uh, please visit sigmaphoto.com or follow us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 
or feel free to call us at our U.S. headquarters. Uh, we'll be glad to answer any of your questions, whether it's about sales or service or anything else. Uh, we're always here Monday through Friday, so feel free to uh, call us here at the office. Um, and we'll also be back on Facebook Live next Thursday with Sigma Ambassadors Jim Kepnick and Annabelle Deflux uh, to talk a little bit more about this lens. Uh, Jim does a lot of photojournalism and commercial photography, and Annabelle does a lot of pet photography as well as very interesting uh, portraits. Uh, she has a very unique style. So if you want to catch up and learn a, bit, a little bit more about how this lens works in those uh, use case scenarios, please feel free to join us next Thursday. And uh, I guess that's about it. So once again, everyone out there, thank you so much for joining us. Brett, Liam, Kedron, again, thank you. And uh, we'll see you next week. Bye-bye, everybody. Peace out. <laughs>